three smelters, one on top of Cupolo Hill behind Mountaineer Pole called the Moffat Tunnel, one down by the railroad depot called the Tamichi Valley Smelter, and one just north of town, you can still see the chimney called the Lawrence and Patrick Smelter. They never used that. Nope. Well, they, they used it for maybe yeah. a day or two. <laughs> yeah. No, none of them worked. Yeah. And they, did, they didn't have high grade ore in this country anyway. But you had three smelters and all the supplies come into Gunnison. Rio Grande is here. On December the 16th, 1881, a black teamster working on the South Park grading crew killed another black man in an argument over a gambling debt. He became the first legal hanging in Gunnison on December the 16th, 1881, and I got a photograph of that at the Gunnison Courthouse, the old Gunnison Courthouse. His name was Thomas Coleman. Initially, Gunnison got their water by a guy named Dope John, who had a sleigh pulled by a burrow and a 100 gallon uh, container, keg, and he brought that through town, he brought water to everybody. And then in 1882, a guy named D.J. McCann, a great engineer, started the gas and water works. <clears throat> $200,000 and water and gas now ran through Gunnison. Very rare to have that. The La Vida Hotel opened up. Four and a half stories high on Boulevard, South Boulevard. Built by a man named Benjamin Lewis. $250,000. Four and a half stories high. Crystal chandeliers, Persian rugs. One traveler passing through looking at that hotel called it a peacock among mud hens. <laughs> and all the, uh, not the napkins, but the, uh, the silk stuff, napkins I guess, had LH on them. And when you had LH on them, they couldn't change, Benjamin Lewis didn't want the hotel name for him, the Lewis House. So they had to abandon that, and they finally figured out they'd name it the La Vida Hotel, which means the vein. And the La Vida became one of the seven great hotels in western Colorado. Others opened up. The Red Lion Inn, north uh, New York and Maine. The Mullen House, New York and 10th Avenue. The Tabor House, Maine and Tamichi. Schools came on Pine Street, Georgia Street, 12th Street, and the 8th Street School still there today used to mentor, said mentors on the top. And Gunnison now dreamed of the day that it would become the capital of Colorado. And then, as soon as they dreamed that, by the year 1882, everything began to die out. None of the silver camps had high-grade silver ore. And as a result, all these thousands of people coming into the silver camps, with two to 4,000 people in each one, began to leave for the San Juan, or Central City, or Breckenridge, or Leadville, or Aspen, the places where you did have great silver ore. One of the stories I tell, and written it up a little bit, Aspen never got a railroad till 1887, November. And it was one of it was the number one silver town in the world, high grade silver. And as a result, the only way you got that ore to a railhead was to put it on the back of 500 burrows, come all the way over East Maroon Pass, drop into Gothic, and then hit the railhead at Crested Butte. And then 500 burrows would take supplies back to Aspen until the railroad came in the year 1887. So, when you talk about the great mining towns in Colorado had great ones, but the Gunnison country didn't have the high grade ore. So when you talk about the great mining towns, you're talking about Uray, Silverton, Telluride, Central City, Blackhawk, Leadville, Aspen, Breckenridge, Creed, those are the great ones. 
but not the Gunnison country. So now the Gunnison country went into what I call the three C's and the big T. And one of the C's was cattle. And this became one of the great cattle countries in the American West. In 1910, Gunnison country had 300 ranches, 40,000 cows, 10,000 horses, and 2,000 hogs. And it was legendary. And every October, thousands of those cows are shipped out from Iola, or sergeants, or in a myriad of places, loaded on the Rio Grande Railroad and sent to the Denver stockyards. In the year 1950, Dan Thornton, who owned a ranch and is now Castle Mountain, had the best bred cattle in the world. And in his dispersal sale of 1949, two of his bulls sold to an Argentinian investor for $50,000 each. In 1949, Maybe a lot more today. The following year, the Republican candidate for governor died unexpectedly. And Governor Thornton, who was well connected with General Eisenhower, soon to become President Eisenhower, and a lot of prominent Republican officials, was talked into being the candidate. And he won. And he won again in 1952 says the governor of Colorado is from Gunnison from 1950 to 1954. In 1950, the Ford Company, Motor Company, came into the Gunnison country and made a film called The American Cowboy, made on Gus Roberson's ranch up Ohio Creek. And we still have that available today. And they talk about the guy getting off the train and going over to Gus's <coughs> ranch. Sandy Salmon, Sandy Dallas now, is the daughter of Gus Roberson and uh, can tell you a little more about that. So the Gunnison country became famous because of cattle. That was one C. The other C was college. 1911 Colorado State Normal College gets started in Gunnison two-year institution, teacher education. Twelve years later, 1923, it becomes a four-year school called Western State College. One of the original faculty members was John C. Johnson. 1928, because he is a Catholic and the Ku Klux Klan has taken over Colorado and Gunnison politics, <laughs> taken over much of the, the West and the U.S., uh, he has to leave, and he goes to a place called Gothic, where he starts the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory, which still exists today, world famous, pioneer studies on climate change and that type of thing. And, of course, the college, university today, brings in a lot of people. That's the second C. The third C is coal in Crested Butte and up Ohio Creek. In Crested Butte, as you go into town, you're going to th see three black splotches high on the left side of the road. Pueblo Mine, Robinson Mine, Buckley Mine. Eleven miles west of Crested Butte, the number one coal breaker in the United States west of Pennsylvania is built five stories high, 1898 at the great anthracite coal town of Floresta. And the Rio Grande ran a spur into Floresta, which lasted until 1928. But this is big snow country, and they had a lot of problems keeping the road open. That's four coal mines. Now you go up the Slate River out of Crested Butte, four miles, and you come to an area the locals call Cloud City. High up above is Smith Hill where the coal was. Down below is the big anthracite coal breaker, built in 1883. Before Floresta, that was the largest coal breaker in the United States west of Pennsylvania. I got four of them. Now you go up the lower loop, north of Crested Butte, and you got the Pershing Mine and the Peanut Mine. 
Now we got six of them. And then in 1884, just west of Crested Bit as you're going up the hill, the Jokerville coal mine exploded and killed 61 miners in the worst mining disaster in Colorado history up to that time and still the third worst ever, seeping methane gas. 46 buried in a common grave in the Crested Butte Cemetery. That's seven. And now we come to number eight. And number eight is on the bench, right to the south of Crested Butte, and that is the Crested Butte CF&I Big Mine, owned by the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company in Pueblo. Third largest coal mine in Colorado. Operated from 1894 to 1952, employed 400 people, $35,000 payroll every month, 70 mules, seven miles of underground tunnels, and that employed the people of Crested Butte. Crested Butte, absolutely indispensable to the Industrial Revolution of the United States because it had 154 coke ovens. And to make steel out of iron, you got to have coke. And what they did was take the bituminous coal, put them in that 154 coke ovens, heat it red hot for 24 hours, driving out some of the impurities, and then it was slag. And then it was loaded onto the Rio Grande and taken to the CF&I steel mills in Pueblo. When you go over Monarch Pass, on the east side, on the right side of the road, you see the great limestone quarry owned by the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company. You gotta have lime to make steel. That is now taken to the CF&I steel mills. Outside of Pueblo, you got iron from a town called Trinidad and around the area. And obviously, you gotta have iron to make steel. They all come together. Coke, iron, lime come together at the CF&I steel mills. Now, where I come from in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, we got towns with names like Ironwood, and Iron Mountain, and Iron River, and Calumet, and a town called Bessemer. And Henry Bessemer of England in 1856 devised the blast furnace. So now you got all three of these things, and they go into the blast furnace and you blast air into the furnace, driving out more of the impurities. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a little more complicated than that than I gave you. That is how you converted iron into steel and powered the U.S. Industrial Revolution. Iron melts at 2,300 degrees. Steel melts at 4,700 degrees. So you want to build buildings made out of steel? Do you want to have uh, rails on the uh, railroad? Do you want to have, uh, you know, uh, cars, rail cars, railroad, all made out of steel? And Crested Butte is very, very important. Now, all of those people who worked in the mines at Crested Butte, the coal mines, came out of Italy, Austria, Slovenia, Slovakia, they all came out of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and they didn't speak English and they had never, ever worked in a coal mine. They were agricultural people. Strange sounding names. Krizmanich, Saya, Veltri, Mahelich. And they were suspicious because they were Catholic. And they weren't wasps. And at that time, the only honorable people in the U.S. were obviously white, Anglo, Saxon, Protestants, better known as wasps. So they weren't highly regarded. Now, I, I grew up, when I talk about this, I, I always chuckle. I grew up in a Belgian farming community, and the Finnish people lived next to us, and they worked in the woods, and we looked down on them because they worked in the woods, and they probably didn't think much of us either. And it was understood you did not date or marry anybody who was Finnish. If you did, nobody's going to the wedding, certainly not your mother and father. And that was true in Crested Butte. And I always tell the story, I'm a senior, well regarded, played football, basketball, etc. There is a sophomore named Lucille Lund, who's beautiful, blonde, 
Vanderbush breaks new ground. Ask her to the prom. <laughs> My mother and father were not happy. Her mother and father were not happy. But the arrangement had been made. We go to the prom and I got her there about 9 o'clock. And I had her home about 9.30. <laughs> you could have cut the tension with a knife. What the hell was going on here? Well, whenever I go by, we laugh about it now. And I'll tell you what, what ended all of this. You know, say you get uh, two people of different nationalities, a Croatian marries a uh, Norwegian, and nobody goes to the wedding. And then a child is born. And one day the uh, mother of the uh, groom says to the father, you know, uh, what do you think if we drop off some of, uh, some of his stuff? So there's a phone call and he said, well, we're, we're coming through Colorado Springs. We got some of your stuff that we didn't get killed. We're going to stop by and drop it off.